What I'm going to talk about today is instructor presence. I call it a rather tortured view through the wonderland of online teaching because I started playing with the um, Alice in Wonderland concept and I just couldn't stop. The um, setting for our online classes can be a little bit intimidating to students. Uh, they don't call it distance education for nothing. When you first sit down at the computer and sign into an online class, it can be a little bit intimidating, even if you kind of know what you're doing around the web. And I've come to the conclusion that there are some falsifications uh, going on here when you first get into an online class as a student. There's a, a false sense of control because they're your buttons and they're your computer and it's your keyboard and it's your mouse and you get this idea that because you're doing the clicking you can control things. At the same time, there is a sense of automation about taking an online class as if you're learning from the computer instead of from a person. And this can be very distancing and alienating for students. The other thing that's involved in the setting of an online class, whether you're using a learning management system or a Ning or a web page, it doesn't really matter. There's a sense of community that most of us are trying to foster. And so people feel that, especially those who, who um, are accustomed to socializing online. But at the same time, there's a very deep sense of loneliness that comes from being by yourself in front of a machine and trying to take a class. So what we have here is a setting that's very different from what we have in a classroom. It's a setting that has a lot of potential for alienation. And my theory is that it's the instructor's job, in fact, it, it may be our main job, to be really present in that setting and to make sure that students feel that we are there and are guiding the class and are helping them. And the reason I emphasize the word feel is that essentially what we're talking about here is the affective domain of teaching. Rather than focusing on our content knowledge, um, we are focusing on creating an environment when we go online that makes people feel, feel comfortable. I, I want to take this from the student's perspective a little bit that I think most students, when they first get into an online class, have a feeling, even on-site class too, have a feeling of curiosity that um, most students are open to new experiences and sort of come into your class going, oh, well, what's, what's this going to be about? Is this going to be interesting? What's here for me? If something goes wrong in that, that curiosity and it's not handled in a way that makes them feel like the instructor is really there, um, the feeling of being lost in the class can happen very, very quickly. And I know some people blame this on uh, navigation, on literally being lost because there's something wrong with the, the navigation. Of course, navigation systems are quite different depending on what you're using. Uh, oftentimes, the instructor has a great deal of control over the navigation, which is great. But there is also um, a sense of feeling lost that can be just sort of endemic and just part of the environment, a certain amount of cognitive dissonance that happens when they experience any navigation system, regardless of, of how well it's designed. And if I know that there are programs on the web where I immediately feel lost, even if I know what I'm doing, uh, do you have experiences with any of those, just sites on the web where well, the first time you got there you just felt totally lost? This is my stage three here is what happens when students fade out, you know, leaving, leaving nothing but a smile here, um, you know, where they're occasionally logging in, but they're not completing all the assignments, or they're not really participating in discussion. And this is kind of what happens when they feel that the instructor isn't there, or doesn't care, or doesn't seem to really be present. And it's this sort of scenario we're trying to avoid, going from the curious stage, oh, what's this class have for me, to the I'm a little lost, I don't really understand what I'm doing, where I'm supposed to go, what I'm supposed to do, no matter how well designed the course is, into this sort of fading out um, where they're less and less engaged. And that's the kind of thing that I want to avoid in my classes, and so I want to keep a few points uh, in mind. We can go ahead and go to the next one and just discuss some ways that we can prevent 
um, the fading out of students. This one seems so obvious. Be friendly. This is actually the hardest thing I had to do. Do I sound friendly? <laughs> I, 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 online, a lot of times I didn't. Online, a lot of times I sounded pedantic or I sounded stern or I, I never really sounded hostile, but when I wrote, and this is, this is just part of writing style, initially when I began teaching online, my writing was very formal. I was very concerned that my online classroom be seen as a classroom and that I am a college professor and so I need to sound like one. And because at that time when I started there weren't a whole lot of audio options, when I wrote, yes, I mean writing, when I wrote, I um, was, was overly formal. I mean, I would almost say stilted. And one way to be friendly was to change my writing style when it was appropriate. It was not appropriate to change it for an exam. I wanted my language on a test, a test question, for example, for an essay, to be very formal. But when I did an announcement or when I made a comment in a forum, I deliberately changed my language to make it sound more friendly and less formal. I'm trying to avoid something that's called the creepy treehouse effect where I try to sound too much like they sound or write too much like they write. And yes, Deirdre is absolutely right. Being too informal um, is a danger. You have to be careful because you do get the creepy treehouse effect. You, you, you are, you're not trying to enter their world. Um, you are trying to be friendly but still be the person who's running the class. And yes, responding to student forums with their names is amazing, not only in forums, but I've also found on exams. When I put a comment on an essay, instead of just writing a comment, one way to be friendly is to just use their name at the very beginning of the comment. I write, Mark, this essay is very good. However, you might consider looking at, because you see, if a whole bunch of text is on a screen and your name is in that mess of text, it kind of jumps out at you. And then the student's first response is, oh, Mark, that's me. And then they're more likely to connect with it, and so it's a friendly thing to do, and it's a, it's a connection. So yeah, using their names is, is very important. So a colloquial tone maybe, for, and especially for instant messaging if you're using that to contact students, or Skype if you're using um, voice, your own voice, to contact students. I know a lot of professors who use Wimba are careful to sound friendly, make sure their voice sounds friendly when they talk on Wimba. And then a more formal tone for writing at least um, in exams and, and where appropriate. Because what, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to model which communications are appropriate for which types of interactions. But at the same time, overall, the informality of my communications in those settings um, does lend a friendly tone to the course. And I put the little smiley face up here on the slide because it took me a while to realize how important emoticons are. At first I thought, I'm not going to do that. That's so tacky. But emoticons are terribly important in informal communication because they let people know, you know, what your mood is at the time that you're writing. In formal communication, you have enough time, enough words, and enough construction that you can do that with the words that you write. But in a lot of the informal communication, by email and in announcements and in messages, it's much better to use the uh, emoticons, smiley faces or winks or whatever, in order to communicate what your tone is behind what you're writing. Um, it's one of the things that, that I think is, yeah, it is almost like Jeffrey's saying it's nonverbal. It is nonverbal communication to use an emoticon. So how to be friendly but not too friendly. I try to find a balance in between that old sage on the stage, I am here to give you wisdom, and I'm your Facebook friend, what are you doing on Saturday? Because being approachable is really close to being friendly. Uh, some ways to be approachable, I wrote be approachable and then I realized I should write seem approachable. I think um, a lot of this is about appearances and how you seem to be online 
because approachability to some people might mean, oh, I'm supposed to be online 24-7 in case they have a question in chat, and that's, that's not at all um, what I have in mind. Being approachable can include things like a little talking head video. To seem approachable, you could just do a little tiny video saying, hi, welcome to the class. Um, I'm Lisa, and these are the kinds of things we're going to be doing this semester. Being able to see you, see you move, hear you speak, um, all of those things can make you seem approachable. One of the things that I really like to use um, for instant messaging, I used to try different instant messaging systems uh, like Yahoo, and I found that people in AOL, uh, Instant Messenger, people have different technologies and they don't always have their messaging open and I don't always want to chit chat so but I want to be approachable when I am online I sure would like to have them be able to um, talk to me at any time um, other things that one can do to be approachable of course we all know about you know respond um, swiftly to emails make it clear to students when your response times are uh, when you're around office hours, uh, using messages, making sure messages get to you. I use Moodle and the messages pop up as soon as you log in and they also send you an email. Blackboard will also um, email you, I believe, with messages as well because tools are important. Um, Alice here has one that's completely inappropriate for the task, a flamingo for um, hitting a croquet ball that's actually a hedgehog anyway. Um, the tools that you choose show your work and show that you're there and show that you're dedicated to the class. It, when you set up navigation systems, for example, where it takes hundreds of clicks to get to something simple that they're going to need every day, um, it sounds like it's not related to instructor presence, but in some ways it is, and it's one of those things that makes them feel lost and, and tune out. If you assign a technology that's, that's hard to use, um, they're not going to use it. And if you are using a technology that you're not used to using, and I've done this before, uh, it's often a mistake because if I'm not comfortable with it, I can't help them with it if they run into trouble. So however cool it is, I need to be totally comfortable using it. And when I use it, if I find a tool that I can personalize somehow, that brings even more of my presence into it where I will um, code something with my name or I'll make a little logo for example, I'm teaching right now in Moodle, which is a, a learning management system, and I spent a lot of time designing a little logo for my class and figuring out how to put it on the page so that it would uh, personalize uh, my class and, and say, hey, this is my space, welcome to my space. That's, that's part of instructor presence, too. It should, should look like my space. One of the really cool things that's happened lately is that people have become more aware of voice. I think Wimbo Voice has helped extraordinarily with this because the tools to record your voice and post it online have been around for a very long time, but they haven't usually been integrated in such a way or easy enough to use that people just kind of jumped in and did it. Uh, now we've got all kinds of tools to do it. In addition to Wimbo Voice, we've got uh, screencasting, free screencasting software like Jing, which will let you actually show your screen and record your voice and uh, be able to communicate that way. Voices is, is, I can't overemphasize it. When I first started teaching online, I wrote out all my lectures. And then um, I had a, a student in my class who was blind, and so he had a, a screen reader. And the screen reader read my printed lecture to him, the, the typed lecture that he saw online, just on a, a web page. And I really hated that idea. And that was the first recordings I started to make were my audio recordings of my voice reading my lectures because, darn it, I didn't want some piece of software reading my work aloud. I wanted this student to be able to hear my voice and uh, he actually argued with me a little bit and said, no, I, I like my, my screen reader. She sounds like Lynn Redgrave. And I, I said, you know, I understand that, but give me a chance and see what you think. And when he heard me reading my own work, he said, oh, that, that is much better. So <laughs> I think being vocal now is recognized as a very important uh, form of communication. 
And so are visuals. Um, we tend to forget that in these, especially in these course management systems that are so text heavy. Uh, we tend to forget that images can be really crucial too. I, before I go to the next um, slide, the other thing I want to comment I want to make about visuals. You can put visuals um, into just images. I'm just talking plain images that relate to what you're teaching onto any web page, into any course management system, and depending on how much you want to get into it, into many different locations on a page or in a course management system. And in fact, we have instructors who, of of the entire front page of their class, half of it is is white space and images that relate to to what they're doing. And yes, changing changing banners uh, can be helpful too, as long as they're not getting getting lost and they know they're still in the class. Uh, visuals add a different element to it. They're not just pictures. They're not just illustrating text can be very heavy. We know, of course, from knowing about individual learning styles that not all students uh, relate to text in the same way a lot of us relate to text. And an image can not only illustrate the text, but can add a different, different level of meaning. Um, some of the slides I've created here uh, from Alice in Wonderland as I was creating them, I was actually realizing that the image itself was adding a different type of meaning than I had intended, but that I liked that and and that it could be used and that can be used in in class as well. Okay, as we move on to the next slide, I'm actually going to get a little bit into the idea of how to make them comfortable as we pull back a little bit. I think a lot of the things that I've suggested for being really truly present and having students feel that you're really, really there, a lot of that we need to stay very much on top of for the first several weeks. And, and Deirdre's commenting on um, you're changing that logo and keeping it up after the first three weeks of class. Um, after the first few weeks, we want the students becoming a little bit more dependent on them, on each other. And we want them to be in a relationship with us where they feel really free to ask questions or if they're lost, they're comfortable saying something. We hope that by this point they're comfortable in the class itself and a little comfortable with their colleagues. And we want to encourage a little more interdependence. But some of that just involves listening, paying attention to what's actually happening in the class. Uh, about the third week of class, I'm taking a very close look at the forum, and I'm trying to see what sort of tone is emerging. And I'm commenting on the tone when I participate in the forums. I'm saying things like, um, this week I noticed that um, whatever the topic is being said at the beginning of the week is carrying all the way through to the end of the week until there's nothing left to talk about anymore. Let's try doing it this way instead. How about the first few people create a topic, and then the, the, the fourth, fifth, and sixth person that come into the discussion, how about, you, how about you create a different topic? So listening to how they're doing things, observing how they're doing things, listening to any comments that you're getting through messages or through chat, and making little adaptations can be especially effective um, after the initial beginning of the conversation. But I'm trying to get into the topic of sort of weaning the students a little bit away from um, your direct assistance. Uh, I have uh, too many students. Forty per class for an online class is, in my opinion, too many students. I teach four online classes each semester. That's 160 students. I want to use the techniques I presented to you because I, I want to make sure that I'm creating an environment that, is, um, th that makes it seem that I'm present for everybody, not just the individual who needs particular help and is going to contact me. So I want to encourage the students to help each other as quickly as possible. And after the first few weeks, that's a lot easier to do. So at some point, being present as an instructor also means stepping back a little bit by encouraging them to help each other. At the beginning, for example, when people have questions, 
I set up a forum, an asynchronous forum in each of my classes called Help, I Have a Question. They post there when they have a question, and I make it clear that those questions are for course things, confusing things, technical things, post right there. I answer them, but not immediately. I wait a little bit, and I encourage them in the instructions to that forum, please help each other out. And the longer we go on, the longer I take to answer things, and the more other students jump in uh, to be able to help each other. They, and I see them doing it. And it, when I see them doing it, I know I've done it right, so that they're not totally dependent on me for every little thing and that they are willing to, to help each other out. So at some point, that instructor presence, I think, needs to just shift a little bit. Collaboration among the students can make me feel like I'm taking a little of a back seat uh, to my class, but I think it's a, a good thing to be organized and set up collaboration between students so that they can work and own part of the space. And them being able to do that makes the instructor presence issue a little bit less important. Now, some people construct their entire class in a way that is collaboratively based, and the instructor is simply uh, a guide on the side, they say, somebody who is who is um, simply coming in when needed. If that is the style of pedagogy that you're using, all the other suggestions that I've made about how to be present still apply. It's just that the, the questions you'll be answering and the things you'll be talking about will be more related to how the collaboration is set up than it will be, you know, how do I do this and, and how do I do that. These kind of collaborative activities encourage a lot of, of interdependence. Um, encourage assessment, I mean that in every possible way. That quick feedback that I mentioned for the larger classes can work for smaller classes too. Low stakes exercises where they have immediate feedback, the computer is essentially answering them. It doesn't really have instructor presence, you're just setting it up, and yet it feels immediate. And there's a sense there that the instructor cares because she gave me something where I can immediately see how I'm doing in the class. There's assessment of your work as well. I encourage students to answer little quick polls or quick surveys. My first one is just called, How's It Going? And it has options on it like, I'm confused. And I was confused at first, but now things are OK. You know, that, that sort of thing. So that I can kind of see very quickly um, what everybody's up to. Those assessments can get more specific as I go along to where I'm doing more classroom assessment techniques. You know, write in something you found confusing this week, write in something that, that is really uh, clear to you this week. Anything that's quick feedback back and forth between myself and my students is a good thing that increases the feeling of connection between what I'm doing and what they're doing. I just like this picture because Alice is like coming there for some help and information and she looks so relaxed and that's what I want my students to do. I want them to come to me um, when they need me for something particular to them and feel comfortable doing that because they feel like they know me, that it's okay to do that so that they can pop into that G chat and chat with me or they can um, send me a, a quick message to ask a question and they know that I will respond, again, getting back to the first side in the, in the um, friendly way that I really want to promote as my um, persona. There's there's some work being done now studying as part of instructor presence a uh, teacher's persona and the creation of a persona dealing with issues like you know do you really want your students with you in Facebook and that sort of thing can you go too far that way or are you being too distant I really want to find that that balance here so that they feel comfortable coming to me and um, talking to me without thinking I'm trying really, really hard to be their friend, uh, which is a, a whole other thing I don't want to get into. So I'm going to stop now, and um, questions, comments, whatever, 